Welcome to the, uh, the session on the global economy. Now, I've actually um, chaired this on several occasions before, and, uh, and it seems to me that uh, you are uh, obviously heroic in, uh, um, in being here, and the fact that you are a relatively small number uh, by comparison with the past suggests uh, what I feel is very strongly the case that we are living in times of high complacency. Uh, <laughs> the world economy is growing very strongly. Everybody, it really it is now becoming a global phenomenon. Uh, it's not just the US and China, India, we know these stories, but also uh, very marked and strong, more than recovery now, growth process in, in Japan, in uh, uh, a sufficiently strong recovery in uh, Europe to encourage uh, um, Mr. Trichet to raise interest rates. There has been a really uh, a global uh, recovery. So um, I see this, the purpose of this session is to indicate um, why there might nonetheless be some reason for concerns and to, uh, to analyze uh, those concerns. And let me just remind you of some rather peculiar facts about this strongly growing economy that we have at the moment. Um, one of them is that since 2001, um, the increase in the official stock of reserves, predominantly dollars, is about half of the total stock of reserves accumulated in the world over the last 300 years. Half of them has been accumulated, about $2 trillion in just three years. Last year, the US household sector that's stress, the household sector ran a deficit of spending uh, in relationship to income of about 7% of GDP. The Japanese private sector as a whole runs a surplus of about 9% of GDP. US imports are about 60% bigger than its exports, and this is what is driving that nice uh, and elegant chart of US, uh, of US borrowing from the rest of the world. Um, uh, the China's surplus on the current account plus long-term capital inflow is about 7% of GDP, um, its basic balance surplus, in other words. So this is what we would have regarded 20 years ago or so as a, an astonishingly unbalanced world economy. Indeed, I can remember very well the widely shared concern about a U.S. current account deficit, which was about half this size, and you can see that at the, under President Reagan just 20 years ago. So the question is, I think we are addressing here is, well, is this safe? Can it last? Uh, who's responsible? Whose fault is it? Um, if, if there's fault at all in any sense, or is it just part of a natural process of globalization? Uh, in a globalized world, capital flows to where it should, can be best used, and it so happens that this fine economy is the one that can use it best. Um, so capital flows to the richest country of the world instead of the predominantly to developing countries. Indeed, the developing countries in aggregate are and have been for some time capital exporters. So this is a very interesting and important and significant issue, and we have a three, uh, we have a, a, a very distinguished panel to address it, um, and I'm going to just uh, introduce them to you in the order of speaking. Uh, the first is uh, Lawrence or Larry Summers, as we we know him, who is now president of Harvard University. He's co-chair of the annual meeting and was, of course, formerly um, uh, U.S. Treasury Secretary. Our second speaker is Mr. Uh, Heizo Takanaka, who's flown all the way from Tokyo last night and has to leave four hours from, from now. So it's, I think, a truly heroic uh, uh, effort uh, he's, he's taken. And he's minister now for international, internal affairs, I apologize, and communications, and particularly responsible for the privatization of the Postal Savings Bank. Uh, our, um, our, our third speaker will be Mr. Palaniapan Chindamaran, who is, of course, the Finance Minister of India. Our fourth will be Mr. Jean-Claude Trichet, who is, of course, President of the European Central Bank. And finally, um, we have an American to begin and an American to end, and I suspect very different perspectives, indicating the rich, the rich uh, variety of opinions in this great free country. Um, and so the last one will be Mr. John Thane, um, 
who is, of course, Chief Executive Officer of the New York Stock Exchange, and you will find a fascinating story about him on the front page of my newspaper uh, this morning. So may I start by turning the question about uh, the world economy and particularly these imbalances and the issues they may raise to Larry Summers. Thank you, Martin. When I was in uh, government, I was fond of warning that the US, that the world economy could not fly forever on a single American engine. Frankly, it has flown further and longer than I would have anticipated. The graph that Martin has put before us demonstrates uh, very clearly that on aggregate, the United States has experienced a period of substantial import-led growth in which the growth of domestic demand has significantly exceeded the growth of domestic production, resulting in about a 4.5% increment in the U.S. current account deficit. That U.S. current account deficit now absorbs about 70% of the exported savings of the rest of the world. The corollary of import-led growth for the United States is export-led growth for the rest of the world on aggregate. The import-led growth for the United States obviously raises questions of ultimate sustainability given a very weak personal savings, given a problematic uh, fiscal position, given accumulation of international debt at a rate that would surely be unsustainable. But the mirror image of that import-led growth in the United States is substantial export-led growth in the rest of the world. How does one tell which is driving which? Obviously, there are important elements of both. The fact that global real interest rates are low rather than high suggests that a demand-supply imbalance in favor of supply in the rest of the world is at least as important a factor as what is going on in the United States. And so the challenge for ultimate stability whether it comes this year, whether it comes next year, will be to marry necessary U.S. adjustment towards increased savings, towards a greater balance between production and domestic demand, with an adjustment in the rest of the world that emphasizes uh, demand. And the crucial question for the global economy is that if it gets what most fervently wish, an increase in U.S. savings, which itself is demand-reducing, combined with a switch of expenditure away from U.S. Um, away from foreign production towards U.S. production, which is the concomitant of a reduction in the U.S. current account deficit, will the rest of the global economy keep growing in a healthy and stable way? That's a challenge for the potential investor in Europe. It is a challenge for the Asian investor. It is a challenge for the recycling of a substantial volume of uh, petrodollars. When will these adjustments take place? Frankly, some of us have been expecting them to take place for quite some time now, and they have not uh, taken place. When you wait and you wait and you wait at the bus and the bus does not come, there are two logical possibilities. One is that it's not running that day and you don't understand the process. And the other is that there are many of them around the corner. My guess is that there are many of them around the corner and that sometime in the next couple of years, this adjustment process is going to come, that it is going to be a quite complex one, and that it will require rather more policy coordination than we have seen to assure that the adjustment in the United States towards increased savings is matched by, by adjustments in the rest of the world that keep uh, the global economy uh, going.
but it seems to me one cannot have a theory that calls for adjustment in a contractionary direction, fiscal consolidation, more prudence on the part of the consumer, less bubble in the housing market through excess liquidity in the United States, without having a theory of what the other adjustments are going to be that is going to keep the global economy uh, growing rapidly. And I don't see, for all the good things that are happening in the rest of the world, that that is fully in place. Thank you very much for laying out the issues in a beautifully lucid way. Um, and, of course, uh, and of course, I agree with everything you've said. Um, uh, the, the, I'm going to turn the floor quite, to, and there are reasons for this now, to Mr. Takanaka. Of course, Japan is and has been for a long time the world's largest surplus country. Um, and it is now recovering. So there is a very profound question. Could domestic demand growth in Japan be strong enough to be part of the expansionary offset to the contraction we can expect uh, in uh, uh, the US if it does finally start raising its savings, reduce its household and uh, its private sector savings and, and reducing the fiscal deficit. Could, could Japan actually generate domestic demand growth? We've seen an astonishing fall in household savings in Japan offset by a huge rise in corporate savings. Is there going to be an investment boom in Japan which would really transform the domestic demand situation? That this would be immensely important, not only for Japan, of course, but for the whole world. Uh, Mr. Takanaka. Well, thank you very much for a oh, very good assignment for me. He speaks English. <laughs> Beautifully. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'd like to discuss uh, mostly what can be done to sustain the economic uh, recovery and also uh, how to consider the imbalance in the uh, global economy. Also, I'll touch upon uh, the assignment to me from uh, Dr. Ulf, investment saving balance of the Japanese economy from now on. Uh, well, uh, let me remember the uh, past experience of the Japanese economy. Five years ago, we were in the midst of a very serious negative growth. And also, we are facing a very uh, serious situation in the financial market. Even the uh, major banks were on the edge of the uh, uh, bankruptcy. The inflation was very serious. But now, GDP growth rate of Japan it's around 2% or 3%, a little bit higher than the potential growth rate. And the last year, Tokyo stock market shattered the numerous record, uh, thanks to the growing expectation of further progress of the reform. Uh, actually, stock price in Tokyo increased by 40% last year. Uh, Koizumi boom in politics created another boom in the market. I'd like to say the interaction between the politics and the economy. The interaction between uh, the policy and the market is quite important. This mechanism should be uh, continued, even in the case uh, we consider this imbalance issue of the global economy. Uh, five years ago, uh, well, NPL quite often appeared on newspapers. NPL meant uh, non-performing wrong, of course. And now, another NPL appears on newspaper, that is, new public, new political landscape. Uh, maybe, again, indicating the importance of the policy framework and the uh, market. Uh, so I spoke here, uh, maybe it was three years ago, I introduced there could be two kinds of reforms that are needed for Japan, but not only for Japan, but also for the global economy. Reactive reform and proactive reform. In the case of Japan, the typical one of reactive reform was the disposal of a non-performing loan. And so far, this has been successfully done. The ratio of non-performing loan uh, in Japan in the total outstanding loan was 8.4% three years ago. But this ratio is now up 2.4%. So I can say, as far as the Japanese economy is concerned, the reactive type of reform has been accomplished. So last year, we challenged another proactive, very ambitious proactive type of reform. That was the privatization of Japan Post. This is also quite related to the investment saving balance from now on in Japan. Because Japan Post is, of course, the postal service company. But at the same time, this is a state-owned bank. And actually, this is the world's largest saving 
the uh, bank. Uh, at, as far as the asset size is concerned, it reaches three trillion dollars, about the double of a city group. Uh, so in order to uh, create uh, more dynamic market-based economy in Japan, the privatization of Japan Post was an essential task for us. Maybe you know that over this issue, we had a very serious political battle, but through election, uh, Japanese people showed a very smart decision supporting the privatization. Please consider this case. Now, we have been carrying huge amount of savings, domestic savings, uh, but amazingly, 26% of the total household saving is going to Japan Post. And this, since this is government money, this cannot be used in an uh, efficient manner in the market. Uh, so since this will be privatized, much more efficient allocation of resource saving will be uh, created uh, from now on. This is another aspect, very important aspect of proactive uh, reform. Uh, still, I'd like to say we are not satisfied yet. Uh, this is also the issue of balance. There could be many uh, things to be done from now on, but important one is still our economy, but not only Japanese economy, but also Chinese economy and the Korean economy, still have the structure of so-called dual economy. Dual economy means, in the case of Japan, we have Panasonic, we have Toyota, very competitive, uh, high productivity uh, sector. At the same time, we have still regulated sector. This regulated sector, the efficient of, uh, inefficient allocation of resources now uh, still realized in the agricultural sector and uh, some service sectors. So if we keep this kind of dual structure, this will provide some uh, inefficiency and uh, this is the real imbalance of, uh, uh, in the economy. Uh, in the case of Korea, for example, they, they have uh, their so-called conglomerate, big businesses. However, uh, small business productivities are low. In the case of China, uh, the gap uh, expanding between uh, coastal area and inland area. So uh, we have to accelerate the speed of proactive reform, especially in Asian area. This will create, again, uh, efficient uh, allocation of the resources. So our uh, problem uh, is whether we can continue the uh, current uh, virtual cycle, virtual cycle between the politics and the market. This will help to solve the imbalance problem in many, many means. Uh, let me mention uh, the investment saving balance in Japan from now on. This was assignment from Dr. Wolf. Well, 10 years ago, household saving ratio was around 15%. Now, this housing uh, saving ratio uh, became about 7% or so, half. 10 years ago, Japan, as a single country, provided the 25% of the total savings in the world. But this ratio has been also declining. Last year, Japan, Japanese total population started declining. Total population started declining. Uh, again, uh, in reflecting the uh, aging society, our saving rate is expected to decline. And in about 10 years or so, our trade deficit will disappear. Still, current account deficit, uh, sorry, uh, surplus. trade surplus will disappear in about 10 years. The current account surplus will continue, maybe 20 years or so. But it is quite clear, total investment saving balance in Japan and in the world will change uh, dramatically. Uh, as for domestic demand, well, investment is expected to increase. Business fixed investment is expect, expected to increase even from now, reflecting the restructuring of the uh, businesses. Still, our investment saving balance will change dramatically even from now. Anyway, it is quite important to realize before that the uh, efficient allocation of resources. In that sense, the regulation and uh, uh, privatization should be continued. So question is whether we can continue the good relationship or good interaction between the politics or policies or, and market or economy. Let me stop here. Thank you very much. And you set out uh, quite an encouraging picture in the both short and medium term. 
Um, it's not quite uh, uh, Larry's uh, two years, but uh, it's uh, a trend over perhaps 10. I think it is worth noting here and stressing that Mr. Takanaki himself has played an enormous, I think, uh, um, quite extraordinarily big role in the policies changes of the last few years, uh, which uh, have brought about uh, this recovery, including, as he himself indicated at the beginning, in the, uh, the management of the NPL issue, which was so worrying some years ago. So um, we've heard from the, uh, a very important source. I'm now going to turn to Mr. Chidambaram, um, presiding over is it the, perhaps the world's second fastest growing economy uh, at the moment? Very, uh, it's an astonishing explosion uh, in India. Uh, it, uh, also, India has, to its credit, is making no significant contribu net contribution to imbalances. It's a nicely balanced economy from the external point of view. So everything looks absolutely wonderful, both in India and its relations with the rest of the world. As it opens up, no doubt its impact will become larger. But the question is, how do you see India's place in, in this uh, global economy and in the context of the imbalances now and in the future? Thank you. Uh, Larry gave the most positive twist possible to the situation. But I must uh, point out that the global imbalances issue is not being addressed by the country most responsible for that. On the contrary, global imbalances are deepening. And these have serious consequences for developing countries like India. Firstly, capital must flow from the developed countries to the developing countries. We are capital-scarce countries. We need more investment, and capital must therefore flow from developed countries to developing countries. What is happening is the exact opposite. And therefore, all these declamations that we make about Millennium Development Goals are meaningless unless we reverse the flows of capital that we see today. Secondly, there are potential triggers that could create serious consequences for the global economy. The first is a southward movement of the dollar. The second, an unexpected increase in U.S. interest rates, which is now being addressed by injecting short increases in short periods, but an unexpected increase in U.S. interest rates will clearly deepen the imbalance. Thirdly, energy prices, and if there's a spiraling of energy prices, it will lead to inflationary expectations, leading developing countries to adopt contractionary policies. All of this, separately and together, do not forebode well for developing countries. I'm happy that India has become a has turned in a marginal current account deficit. And in fact, developing countries should be allowed to run slightly higher current account deficits in order to attract capital. That's not what is happening. So while India will contribute to global stability by continuing to follow prudent fiscal policies containing the fiscal deficit, keeping tight control on expenditure, increasing capital investment, increasing output, and trying to maintain a high growth rate of 7 to 8% a year, and going, trying to go beyond 8% through raising investments and raising efficiency. I'm afraid we are concerned about the deepening global imbalances, and I should put that on the record. Two other things, which perhaps we can come to later, protectionist tendencies in developed countries, 
and the rather slow pace of the Doha round. These are two concerns, but we can address that later if Martin wishes. Thank you. Thank you very much, for, um, particularly for stressing a point that I indicated at the beginning, the, the quite apart from the sustainability of this, there is something really worrying about a situation in which, with such huge needs and potential in the developing world, the flow of capital should be on aggregate from developing countries to developed countries, um, and also for indicating other sources of concern, which I think we should certainly uh, turn to um, uh, at a subsequent moment in this discussion. Um, let me now turn, if I may, to Jean-Claude Trichet, um, President of the European Central Bank. The Eurozone, in fact, is a, quite interesting. It doesn't have much of an imbalance, um, largely because the enormous surplus now being generated by Germany is, as it were, offset by some very sizable deficits elsewhere, notably in Spain. Um, part of the, the rich uh, diversity of European life, I suppose, and the European economic system. But how do you, uh, Jean-Claude, see the European economy's role in this global context? Uh, can you envisage uh, a situation as, as the Eurozone in particular recovers in which, um, to, following on from what Larry said, uh, Europe would actually become a demand engine in the world, uh, spilling over excess demand to the rest of the world, or as it has been for much of the last four or five years, uh, an economic system with really rather, rather weak and in, in many ways disappointingly weak uh, demand growth and for some time very heavy dependence on export uh, for ex on exports uh, and that's been particularly true of course of Germany the biggest single uh, country in Europe um, Jean -Claude. thank you thank you Martin uh, first of all I would say that uh, as you said for India and as you just said we are arithmetically balanced and uh, when I look at the last figures which, uh, which we have, uh, for instance, uh, Q2 and Q3 of last year, we, were, we had a slight deficit of the current account. So whether it is because uh, they are uh, offsetting between some uh, part of the euro area and others, uh, what we consider is the euro area as a whole, what counts at the global level is certainly the euro area as a whole, and the euro area as a whole is balanced. That, of course, suggests that uh, the correction of the very large imbalances that we are observing cannot arithmetically rely upon us. But we trust, and I trust, and it is the global diagnosis at the level of the international community, that we can nevertheless contribute, and I would say actively contribute, uh, within the framework of a cooperative strategy, which again uh, is agreed upon. We have to elevate the level of our growth potential through structural reforms. Uh, there is an agreement on that. There is a consensus in Europe. And the problem is the delivery, obviously. And uh, we call, of course, in the European Central Bank for being as active, as efficient, as effective as possible in the delivery of those structural reforms. The fact that we would grow faster will facilitate the smooth adjustment of the big imbalances and will be a major contribution. Again, not arithmetically, and we should never forget that. Uh, that being said, the call I just made on actively implement what has been agreed upon would, of course, be also directed to the other partners at the level of the international community. The US, and I will fully share what uh, has been said by uh, by Larry have to correct this lack of savings, which is obviously non-sustainable, certainly in the long run or in the medium run. And uh, we know what uh, we have to do, uh, or they have to do, or the US has to do in terms of correcting uh, the fiscal imbalance uh, domestic and in, in elevating the level of savings in the US. It is also true that it would be part of a cooperative exercise which supposes that the rest of the world also contributes. And I entirely share the view of the Indian minister. It is profoundly abnormal that there is a very, very large flow of financing going from the developing world, the emerging countries and economies, towards the 
industrialized world. And this is true not only for the US, it is true for the OECD as a whole. We are really the recipient of enormous flows uh, if I take the industrial economies as a whole. But that supposes also that the policies of the emerging countries and their domestic demand is uh, such as the current account would not be as uh, largely in surplus. I don't speaking for any particular economy, of course, but for the emerging uh, economy as, as a whole. And, and that supposes uh, an, an implementation of that strategy, fostering domestic demand, and uh, also, as you know, at the level of the international community, we are recommending some kind of flexible uh, adjustment as regards uh, the currencies themselves. Uh, I stick strictly, if you permit, uh, Martin, to the communique of the G7 that everybody knows, but it is part of the exercise. Uh, and I would add only two things. One, to stress again the fact that it is not sustainable in the long run that the emerging world would finance the industrial world. It doesn't correspond to the interest of the emerging world, not neither to the interest of the uh, industrialized world. It doesn't correspond to a normal attitude of aging wealthy uh, societies which have to pave the way for the future. And it would be normal to have, for that reason, a current account surplus on a permanent basis. I don't mean on a year to year basis, but as a trend in the medium and long term. And the second remark I would make is that it is urgent to deliver. And again, I address this message to the European, of course, but also to the rest of the world. Thank you very much uh, for setting uh, uh, that out. Um, I suppose one could, and we'll come to this in a moment, ask, ask whether, uh, again, arithmetically, if uh, the US current account deficit is to shrink, other countries' uh, surpluses must shrink or countries' imbalance must move into deficit. Uh, one might think that part of it will be the latter, and the Eurozone as the world's second largest economy would seem possibly to be uh, an economy that could easily afford going into modest deficits. So well, don't, don't, not, don't count on me, Martin, to call for that. Huh? <laughs> I, I'm not counting on you, alas. Uh, <laughs> that seems to me part of the problem. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to turn now finally to John Thane. I think one of the most interesting questions in considering the sustainability of this very fascinating situation is the use that is being made in the United States and particularly by the private sector of the capital that is being supplied mm -hmm. to it. Uh, one of the interesting features, however, of the last four or five years, this was not true in the late 90s, is that the investment rate as a share of GDP has been constant. So the, the big adjustment, if you look at it at the national level, uh, has been a fall in savings, both public and private. Um, not corporate, the corporate savings position is fantastically strong, and the remarkable thing in the American corporate sector until relatively recently has been its extremely disciplined attitude, I think one could say, to investment. Indeed, uh, that explains a great deal that's going on. But one might say, well, if you've got a situation in which the productive sector is not investing uh, with enthusiasm, and yet the country as a whole is borrowing vast quantities of money, um, this doesn't look very comfortable. Um, so how do you see it uh, from your point of view in terms of the use that is being put, uh, that this money is being put to, and uh, particularly the role of the corporate sector in the US going forward? Mm. Sure, thank you, Martin. You know, Whenever you look at a particular set of circumstances, it's always a question of whether the glass or perhaps the bus is half empty or half full. And I, at least looking at the world and even listening to this group, um, continue to believe in the half full category because if you look and we've talked about um, the world is growing, the, econ the economies of the world are growing and, and, and pretty much everywhere in the world, the US, Japan as we heard, China, India, and even Europe, and when we focus specifically on, on the United States and on the imbalances in the United States, the U.S. budget deficit, which we really haven't talked much about, uh, is, is of concern, uh, but is getting better, is narrowing, both in terms of dollars and in terms of uh, percent of GDP. 
And the current account deficit, which uh, you have up there, uh, which I do note that it got a little bit better, but still is a concern, I think the question is, and uh, hopefully we'll come back to this, is why, given the size of the current account deficit, has the U.S. dollar remained as strong as it has? And let me put forth at least one reason, which comes back to the whole flow of funds and flow of capital. And that one of the reasons, I believe, is that the U.S. continues to be attractive uh, for investable capital in the world. And so money is flowing into U.S. investments. And it's flowing into uh, both fixed income investments and U.S. equities. On the fixed income side, and I think this is also a question we should explore, I think one of the reasons you see the, the flow from the developing uh, countries to the, into the U.S. on the fixed income side is the desire to maintain artificial exchange rates. And so the very large um, uh, uh, surplus being built up in countries like China is uh, directly due to uh, the lack of flexibility in their exchange rates. And I think that's one of the reasons which we should probably come back to. But I also think that uh, the flow of funds into uh, equities is important because uh, at least through October, the net purchases of U.S. stocks uh, in, by, in, in, through international sources was about, was about $75 billion. So U.S. equities are also attractive to the world. Now, um, I think that um, when you look at the global flow of funds and the investable capital, um, developing countries can in fact attract uh, capital if they have the proper policies. Um, we talked a little bit about this uh, yesterday on a panel on jobs uh, where we talked about how do, you, how do you increase the number of jobs and the way you do that is you inc increase economic growth and the way you increase economic growth is having good government policies that encourages the private sector. So open markets, free trade, empowering entrepreneurs, having sensible regulation, having lower tax rates on capital and labor, um, reducing state monopolies and in, in, in improving or encouraging private ownership, a sound and stable banking system, of which Japan is, is certainly the best example of what happens when you fix your banking system. Um, those kinds of things can encourage uh, a flow of funds, and I use the example of Jordan. Uh, f since signing the free trade agreement with the United States, the uh, direct investment in Jordan uh, has uh, quadrupled. Um, so there are things that can be done in the developing world uh, to uh, attract investment. Um, the, only, the one other area I just want to mention because it's on our list of topics is the housing sector in the United States. Um, I think there's no question uh, that um, housing prices, are, the increase in housing prices are going to slow. Housing prices are up 34% uh, over the last three years. Um, Larry actually has a specific example of, of, of a decline in housing prices. Um, but um, if you look at housing and what drives housing prices in the U.S., um, it's first of all employment, and, uh, and obviously the employment uh, picture in the United States is very good. It's second of all consumer confidence, which is also very strong. And another thing which, uh, when, you, when we talk about the debt of consumers, and, and there is a concern about uh, rising interest rates and what that does to adjustable rate mortgages, um, but American households' total net worth is still up dramatically. If you, if you look at what the net worth of U.S. households, it's about $51 trillion, uh, which is double what it was 10 years ago. Uh, so I think the U.S. consumer uh, still has a, a lot of capacity to, to absorb uh, what, are, what, are, uh, what is, in fact, a rise in interest rates, uh, but still at relatively low levels, absolutely. Um, so I, I am optimistic about the outlook for the world, uh, and um, there are risks to it. Uh, some of them were already talked about. Um, energy prices is certainly a, con a concern. Uh, I also share the concern on the protectionist tendencies uh, and, and concerns about the continuation of, of expansion of free trade. Um, but overall, I, I am optimistic about where we are. And frankly, that's reflected of where the equity markets are. You look at uh, the equity markets, uh, uh, Takanaka-san mentioned Tokyo, but also in the U.S. and, and frankly in Europe. Uh, the equity markets are reflective of that optimism. Uh, and when I talk to corporate CEOs, and this gets back, Martin, to your specific question, um, corporate CEOs are very confident right now. That, you sh that shows up in surveys on, on, on corporate confidence. Uh, and I think they are beginning to make more investments in, on the capital side. And so I think that that area will improve. I think that uh, coming out of the bursting of the bubble and the slowdown, um, corporate CEOs were very reluctant either to add people or invest in more capital until they saw growth in their businesses and in their economy. 
I think that's why you saw employment in the U.S. lag the uh, recovery. Uh, but I think you see now both uh, an improvement in employment and you will see an improvement in uh, corporate investment. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, I'm going to turn this to the floor in about five minutes. So uh, you're going to, five or six minutes, so I want you to all think of your sharp questions you want to ask. But I want to turn to Larry, and I, I imagine we have lots of re reactions, but I have one specific question you probably may be thinking about anyway. If we think sort of logically about the counterparts of which you discussed in your opening of uh, an adjustment in the US, if that were to happen, in fact, it hasn't, of course, um, logically, either developed or developing countries are going to have to adjust. Well, we've heard from the develop, major developed regions, uh, I don't know, I'll be interested in your reaction to what's been said about Japan and Europe, but if you look at the, the developing country side, which Mr. Chajadamba mentioned strongly, um, this would require either reductions in surpluses or in some cases, clearly, moving into deficit, and the counterpart of that will be a net capital flow to these countries, which would be desirable. Now, as you know better than most, given your time in office, uh, large net flows of capital to, to emerging markets have tended to lead to, or at least uh, to be followed by, uh, large crises. Uh, and we've been rather happily crisis-free for some years, apart from the Argentina uh, uh, debacle. We haven't had any major global crises now since uh, 97 to 98. So is there a, do you believe that the world financial system and the changes in policies in emerging market economies are such now that we could actually run a large or see large net capital flows to emerging market economies without risking a return of the crisis phenomenon? I'm going to be so presumptuous as to make another remark or two, and then I will, I promise, answer your question. Look, the, I think everyone here agrees that it is anomalous and non-permanent for there to be a large flow of capital from the developing world to the industrial world. And the question is, why is it happening and how is it gonna reverse itself? There are two broad theories as to what the underlying force that's causing it to happen are. One is the one that I frankly would prefer to believe, but I think is only a portion of the story. And that is that the profligate United States leading the profligate industrialized world is not saving, is consuming at a fierce rate, and therefore sucking capital that would otherwise be productively invested in the developing world out of the developing world. My Indian friend suggested something of that kind. And there's surely some element of truth in it. But there are two broad anomalies you have to confront if you believe that. The first is that global real interest rates are low not high. If there were all these investment opportunities and there were all these crazy consumers and there were all these profligate fiscal deficits, you'd expect unusually high real interest rates like we had in the 1980s, not unusually low real interest rates like we have today. The second anomaly that view has to confront is that the largest counterpart of the U.S. borrowing is an increase in the holdings of dollar reserves by foreign, central, by foreign central banks that have actively sought to build up their reserves and to build reserves way beyond any level that could be linked with insulation from 1998-style financial crisis with the exchange rate manipulation uh, objective that John Thane referred to. And so, yes, there is a strat, yes, the United States is being profligate, but the rest of the world is substantially pursuing an export-led growth strategy in order to get the demand. And if you think this is going to work itself out, you need to have the adjustment take place on both sides. You have sat here and you have heard that the United States current account deficit needs to move by four or five percent of GDP by a couple of percent, uh, one and a half percent of world GDP. As a matter of arithmetic, if the United States stops having such domestic demand-led growth, the rest of the world has to have less export-led growth. Now, there are, as a matter of logic, 
three places where that can come from. The first and the most benign and happiest which we would all support, but I think it's difficult to make the case that it is quantitatively large or can be quantitatively large over the next five years, is the example suggested by John Thane's Jordan observation. There are developing countries that don't have as healthy investment environments as they would like. If they had healthier investment opportunities, there would be more profits for investors to earn. People would switch capital there. There would be more global demand, and the economy would move forward. Absolutely right. Question is, what are the problematic large places that are likely to fix themselves in that regard? If that were the dominant aspect, you would expect to see a pattern like you did in the 1980s of substantial capital, private capital flight from the developing country flowing into OECD financial institutions. That's not the large pattern in the situation. Second place where it can happen and where probably the largest part of it has to take place is adjustment in the countries that are currently, currently accumulating all of those reserves as the counterpart of an exchange rate strategy of maintaining very substantial exports. When will that happen? How will that happen? That very much remains to be seen, but you cannot look at the U.S. current account deficit in isolation from the very conscious economic strategies of very large numbers of the most rapidly growing countries in the world of maintaining exports to the United States and to the industrial world as a major source of their growth. And in my judgment, that's where the largest part of the adjustment has to take place. And that means two things. It means an adjustment in the exports, and it means an adjustment in some other domestic policy on the consumption and investment side to provide the demand that's necessary as the export-led growth slows. And then the third piece of uh, the puzzle uh, is, of course, uh, what happens in the industrialized uh, world. And one can only applaud uh, Jean-Claude's invocation of the spirit of Lisbon and the need for structural reform uh, in uh, Europe. Uh, the questions go to the pace at which it will take place, and I confess to being a little bit surprised by his resistance to the notion that a structural reforming Europe could well benefit from being a mild importer of capital uh, in order to pull the economy uh, forward. So the industrialized countries are the third part, but anyone who wants to see the U.S. current account deficit go way down has to be prepared to explain where do they expect imports to rise substantially more rapidly than exports. Mr. Chitambaram, respond to that challenge. Yes. If more capital flows to developing countries, more investment takes place there, there'll be more demand there, and exports will go from exporting countries to those countries. The direction of exports will change. It's false to assume that because the U.S. is importing, every country is able to sustain uh, an export-oriented economy. I think the direction of exports will change, and these exports will take place after some lag to the other countries where I think these goods and services are required. Secondly, what will happen is a country like China would be forced to stimulate domestic demand. It is suppressing domestic demand, keeping savings at 50%, and exporting its surpluses. They, I mean, I'm not judgmental about China, but we believe that the people of developing countries also ought to have a higher level of consumption of goods and services. So I think if the US adjusts, the US saves more, US curtails its consumption, after some lag, the system will adjust itself, exports will go in another direction, and there will be greater domestic demand and domestic consumption in the developing countries, leading to a rise in the standard of living of the people of those countries. I think actually the, we may come back to this, the, the, the position is logical, but the, the concern I would have, and I suspect Larry might have too, about the path you outline, and I've thought about it quite a bit, is that it goes via a 
quite a significant global recession, which is not a very comfortable way to bring about the adjustment. Um, and that perhaps is the right way to introduce your point, because surely Europe must do more to, to, to end, generate a demand engine if the US ceases to be one. Well, f first of all, I, it seems to me that there is a large deal of consensus around this uh, panel, because we all agree that we all have homework to do. Homework in the US, homework in the emerging world, homework in Europe, homework in Japan. And that, that's important. Uh, uh, and that is uh, certainly the present level of the international uh, community diagnosis. Uh, I fully agree that uh, a lot of work has to be done by the emerging world. That's clear enough. And the shift from savings to domestic demand is really a major shift. That, that, there is no doubt. I stick, as I said, to the G7 message as regards uh, flexibility in the exchange market, which is part, of, certainly, of the solution also. Uh, the, the, problem, the problem we have is to coordinate in a sufficient uh, effective fashion that we would change the derivative of those imbalances. And we did not yet change the sign of the derivative. We still see these imbalances augmenting. Uh, I would be reassured myself when the, the sign has changed of the derivative and when they start diminishing. And it seems to me that then we would be in a virtuous circle because we will all see that we are paving the way for a more sustainable uh, constellation of positions in the world. Let me add two remarks. I said that I would not certainly make an eloge of deficits, external deficits in Europe. It seems to me that it, there is a slight logical contradiction to say imbalances are not very good and to, to figure out an entity which is not imbalanced and to say, well, why, why don't you start Small being a little bit imbalanced? So I only draw your attention to that. I trust that whilst non-arithmetically uh, being a major contributor to the solution of the U.S. imbalances, namely by not shifting from the U.S. to Europe part of the U.S. current account deficit, only by going much faster we can help, clearly, uh, because we would then pave the way for uh, global growth, which would be uh, more substantial, even in period of uh, possible slowing down, and then we would help the U.S. and the emerging world and Japan to correct their imbalances. Second remark. I really trust that the very, very pertinent remark of Larry, that if there really was a sucking of savings by the US, which would be very abnormal, then it would materialize in real rates and in spreads that would be much higher. But my understanding of what has happened over the last two, three years is that we do not observe that because of the large part of additional savings that the oil exporting countries have contributed to bring about. Without this uh, phenomenon, I have the suspicion that we would have already started to see that the ex-ante supply and savings and ex-ante investment would be totally different from what we are observing today and probably the real rates would, would be substantially higher. At least it is my conjecture. Uh, looking at, uh, at the figures, uh, at the enormous additional pot of savings that has been accumulated by the oil exporting countries. And there is a paradox there because it has apparently a good influence on the financial market. It has, of course, a very, very depressive influence on the economy as a whole. This is a fascinating, deep discussion of global macro balances and Keynesian ISLM models. Um, the trouble is we're not getting to the floors, but I'm the other two speakers do want to say something briefly, and then I promise to go to the floor. Let me raise very small comments. Uh, so far, we have been discussing in this session investment based upon investment saving balance. Yes, investment should be equal to saving, and uh, some deficit should be financed by surplus. This is identity. However, please remember, we have very similar discussion 20 years ago, focusing the U.S. deficit, U.S. dollar, is the strong dollar sustainable? This was written by uh, 20 years ago by Paul Krugman. But, but my, my point is, anyway, it depended on the change in potential growth rate in the case of the United States. Uh, 
compared with 20 years ago, potential growth rate was increased based upon the technological progress and the reform effort. Uh, this, the, we should not forget uh, this point, why U.S. Uh, consumption is increasing. This is partly because the expected rate of growth is increased. Why Japanese uh, propensity to consume is increased. This is, uh, in a sense, the uh, result of the expected uh, increase of the uh, uh, increase in expected growth, also reflecting demographic change. So we should identify the growth change and demographic change and technological progress, etc. But anyway, only solution is anyway to increase potential growth rate for the United States, for Japan, for European countries, and also for developing countries. John. Yeah, I just wanted to add one thing on the interest rates, and, and particularly as to the shape of the U.S. yield curve. Um, the um, foreign exchange uh, reserves that are being accumulated by the developing countries primarily are being invested in um, U.S. treasuries or agencies, and that is certainly at least one of the reasons why the longer end of the interest rate curve is uh, the yields are as low as they are. I think that's clearly right. Just make, may I make one tiny factor correction? Um, in December, um, uh, China, uh, by the stroke of a pen, lowered its savings rate from 50% to 40% of GDP by discovering, by discovering a, a previously n unnoted service sector. So it is important to note that China's savings don't look quite as, as staggering uh, anymore. And everything that we wrote about that is uh, now subject to revision. Still, even where they are slightly below 40%, they're pretty impressive. May I turn the discussion to the floor? Um, I don't think we've reached a complete conclusion. Um, gentleman here. It's uh, Suhail Seed from India. I have a question for uh, Mr. Trichet. As Mr. Chidambaram said, one of the things in India that's been done reasonably well is control on expenditure. A large part of Europe has a huge drag on its economies from welfare policies that it has to sustain. Linked to that, if you have aging economies, let's say Germany, which, which has, a, has a rapidly aging population, and index that to the uh, large amount of welfare expenditure that the state has to incur, how do you see that playing out as, as the years go by? Will welfare cause a tremendous drag on economic imperatives and what is the solution for that? Thank you. I think it's a very good question. Uh, Indeed. Can we sustain the welfare state? Or as we call it, the European social model? Yeah. I think that there is a, a very, very large possibility without, in those economies and society in Europe that are attached to the model, the social model of Europe, to improve efficiency considerably. And I draw this conclusion from comparison between the public spendings as a proportion of GDP in various countries, in various economies, where the uh, reputation of the social safety net and the protection in general is uh, the same. And you have enormous differences. You can have 8% of the GDP. You can have 9% of the GDP differential. So an enormous possibility exists in Europe in working out a methodology to have a much better, much more efficient way of dealing with the social protection in general. And it is certainly part of those structural reforms that we are going. There is a link between the structural reforms and which, of course, embrace the structural reform of the state itself and of the social protection and this uh, better functioning of the economy in general. Perhaps also mentioned, given your opening remark, that the uh, though I think there are good reasons for it, given the growth of the Indian economy, that the uh, general government borrowing requirement in India is, would also substantially exceed the Maastricht criteria, in fact, by two and a half times. Um, Dick Cooper. Uh, in uh, Larry's... Could you explain who you are, please? Yeah, Richard Cooper, uh, Economics Department, Harvard University. Uh, Larry's uh, uh, colorful metaphor about the buses not coming, I guess I'm of the second school, which is that uh, <clears throat> they're not running today and we don't understand the process. Uh, I'm going to make two remarks 
with a uh, uh, the very briefly, please, with, with the objective of evoking a reaction. The first is until Takanaka's brief introduction uh, comment at the end, demography was not mentioned, and I think we are in a period in the rich countries of profound demographic change and it has profound implications on savings, investment behavior. I won't say more, there's a long story. What's interesting about that is the US stands out among rich countries as an outstanding exception. It's different from Japan, from Germany, from Italy, even from France uh, in this regard. So I, I believe that the structure of the current situation, uh, savings investment imbalances is much more deeply embedded than was suggested or implied by the panel. The second observation is, again, goes especially to what Takanaka and Trichet said, the Lisbon agenda and all of that, just to remind you, that is to increase the capacity of the economy to grow. It does not increase demand automatically. To meet Summer's criteria of increased demand if the U.S. current account deficit is going to decline, demand has to go up. So a further link has to be made, even if the Europeans are smashingly successful on the Lisbon agenda, there's a further link that has to be made, which is to translate that into higher demand and not into higher export competitiveness. I think the, just let me go to the second question. I think because it, it's a very relevant point, um, if we're looking at the external imbalances side, and obviously it's very desirable to have faster growth itself, that would help a great deal. Uh, as uh, Dick Cooper said, we've got to have a growth in demand which exceeds the growth in capacity. So that implies something quite strong on the demand side, over and above whatever happens on the capacity side if we introduce the reform agenda. If you look at this issue, Jean-Claude, how, how do you look at that issue, this relationship that we would have to see? Otherwise, we have the concern that in Europe will improve its competitiveness, improve its supply, and actually the export surpluses might rise again. Um, first of all, I would make a difference, if you permit me, between Japan and Europe. Japan has a substantial, a big current account surplus. If our main aim is to try to reduce this consolidation of imbalances, then clearly demand must augment in Japan. Europe is in slight deficit in Q2 and Q3 last year. We will see exactly what are the most recent figures. We are not in the same situation. I make the point, we are not in the same situation. That being said, I don't exclude that uh, structural reforms, which undoubtedly, like Professor Cooper suggests, in, in the long run uh, are not per se, of course, changing uh, the uh, investment and, uh, and savings balance, uh, can nevertheless, at a period of transition, have such effect. I don't exclude that. I take, for example, the uh, uh, structural reform that would permit a big increase of productivity in the non-tradable sector, and, which is absurd in the U.S. And the main difference between the U.S. and Europe uh, since '96 is probably that in a number of areas, including retail, which is uh, by definition non-tradable sector, we, we see uh, labor productivity progress, which is unbelievably higher than in Europe. And then, of course, you could have an impact, a medium-term, short to medium-term impact on, on demand, which would uh, undoubtedly perhaps contribute to the uh, uh, solution of the imbalances. But again, don't ask an area which arithmetically is in slight deficit to contribute massively arithmetically to the solution of imbalances. Interesting philosophical question, which I won't go into any further. Um, I think I'll pocket demography because I think we're clear that this is a very important uh, issue. May I mention just one factual point? While the Eurozone is not in uh, a significant surplus, Europe contains two astonishingly large surplus countries uh, given their size, and one of them is this one, and the other is Norway. And Norway has quite a good reason. It's quite an interesting situation. Um, next question. Uh, not Steve yet. This. Uh, Gentleman next, this gentleman there. Yeah, Clark Winter, Citigroup Investment Strategy. A question about reform. What if the Chinese banking reform were to proceed at anywhere the speed of their construction progress, and they were to shift their capital flows to finance their own consumers 
rather than ours. What effect do you think that would have on capital flows? Does anyone wish to comment uh, on the consequences of uh, Chinese banking reform, on uh, the possible move towards, I suppose, a consumer-led economy, lower savings, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, transformation? But this has to be done, of course, in the context of understanding that most of the accumulation of reserve, uh, accumulation of uh, almost all the counterpart, in fact, all, not almost, all the counterpart of the, uh, uh, of the flows from China is, is essentially official. But does somebody, would you like to sure. comment on that? A small comment. Well, I, I'm not a specialist of the Chinese banking system, but based upon the experience of the bank reform in Japan, well, uh, bank, uh, Chinese banks are carrying about uh, very high 30% or 40% very high non-performing loan ratio still. Uh, if this is uh, improved, much more allocation resources will be uh, realized, and this will raise the expected rate of, of growth, and this will help. Also, in the case of China, they have a huge amount of postal savings, and they are now planning, I heard, they are planning to privatize this cell. This will also help. So the uh, movement is very slow at this moment, but they are now moving, shifting toward that direction. John. Yeah, I, I think there are two different things here. One is the accumulation of foreign reserves really by the central bank and, and the purchases of U.S. Um, US uh, securities, which, which has more to do with the exchange rate than it does with the banking system itself. Um, I, I, I agree completely that uh, China needs to reform its banking system and, and to get a functioning banking system in Japan is the perfect example of what happens when you don't do it and then what does happen when you, when you finally do it. Um, and so I think that that is very important. The other thing that, uh, which is important in China, which is actually a very interesting difference between China and India, is the Chinese capital markets system doesn't work either. And so you look, uh, China's economy growing north, north of 9%, it's difficult to have your, your economy growing at 9% and have your equity market decline. And, and the reason for that is, is that um, unlike uh, India, where the equity market has done very, very well, um, the Chinese capital markets really are not functioning right now, and that's a big problem for China, and it will grow as China's economy grows because it will impede the domestic uh, ca capacity of the economy. Larry. Medium run, uh, constructive, short run, who knows. More generally, the Chinese, I believe, would do very well to study the Japanese experience of the 1980s in terms of the long run consequences of exchange rate uh, management, in terms of the long run consequences of allowing increasing asset prices and happiness to delay processes of financial market reform. Okay, I'll give Steve. Very, very short. We're running out of time. That's a question. I'll be short. It's a question. Uh, Steve Roach, Morgan Stanley. To the extent that the U.S. savings shortfall is an important part of global imbalances, to the extent that the um, U.S. saving shortfall is driven uh, by um, uh, equity extraction from asset bubbles, isn't there a role for policy, especially central bankers, to deal with the excesses of asset markets? And Mr. Takanaka, I would uh, say also, is a common, is a very different set of circumstances than was the case 20 years ago, the last time we had these imbalances. I guess question for uh, Mr. Fichet and Larry. And Larry. Okay, I think the, I'm gonna start with, with Jean-Claude. Um, actually, it's a very, very significant and very good issue, ECB monetary targeting, uh, well, not monetary targeting, reference uh, value. Um, what is the role of central banks in uh, Man in responding to asset price movements. Um, Martin, I will disappoint a little bit Steve. I am in the PERDA period, which means that I cannot and I should not give any hint to monetary policy that could be interpreted as uh, uh, suggesting that we could do this or that in our future meeting next week. Uh, it, on a question of that sort, it's very difficult to avoid over-interpretation. <laughs> Central bankers are unbelievably frustrating, aren't they? <laughs> uh, so I'm going to turn it over to, to, uh, to Larry. Um, uh, what, 
and it's particularly interesting given that Ben Bernanke is taking over now and his views on this are very well known. What is your view? I think it's a mistake to be uh, religious about the irrelevance of any uh, variable in making monetary policy. I think that among central bankers are concerned with price inflation, asset prices are uh, prices. On the other hand, I think the first three subjects to discuss when you're discussing U.S. low savings are the budget deficit, the budget deficit, and the budget deficit. And the most potent and reliable way to increase U.S. national savings is to do something about the budget. And that's where I'd want to put my emphasis. I'm going to make one other comment, if you'll permit me, Martin, because it maybe frames uh, a portion of the issues we've been discussing. I would suggest to you that there was more serenity about the Nikkei at 35,000 than there was at 27,000. That there was more serenity about Mexico in the fall of 1994 than there was in the spring of 1994. That there was more serenity about uh, the NASDAQ at 4,500 than there had been at 35. And those of us who are concerned about the way these imbalances will play out have admittedly a bit of a cry wolf uh, problem. The way in which markets have moved over the last year is entirely inconsistent with what that kind of prediction, um, which was widely made a year ago and widely made two years ago, would have led one to expect. And so it is possible to conclude that those predictions are all wrong. It's also possible to conclude that it is a situation that uh, parallels my NASDAQ, Nikkei, and Mexico uh, examples where the moment of maximum risk actually is not the moment of maximum alarm, but is when the alarm has passed and complacency has set in, and yet the necessary adjustments are that much larger. Mr. Chidambar. Martin, I just want to make a comment because I know you're running out of time. The unstated premise of much of this discussion is that the developed countries, maybe justifiably, wish to maintain the standards of living of their people. What is being forgotten is that there is a large part of humanity which is poor, which has aspirations. Many countries are making efforts, and therefore, the developed countries must show as much concern, if not more, for the capital requirements, the consumption requirements of the poor countries and the developing countries. Uh, I'm afraid that uh, uh, this discussion seems to uh, be oblivious to the needs of the developing countries. I'm fortunately, I'm always very frustrated in discussions. I feel a bit that I've failed a bit to keep, to discipline the, these immensely brilliant people in timekeeping, so we didn't get as many questions as I would have liked. And I think the discussion has just begun to get really interesting, um, particularly, with that, particularly with that last remark. Um, and I'm, but we can't take any more questions. I would summarize it roughly as follows. Uh, the world economy is in great shape. We either are or are not very close to uh, going over a very high waterfall. Uh, and uh, the world economy would feel much the same if we were or weren't. And we will find out at some point whether we are about to go over the waterfall. I should uh, um, uh, say that we're clearly not going to do anything to prevent ourselves from going over it if that is indeed what, what is in prospect. Um, my very first column of this year referred to this uh, issue in the context of something which is called a Taleb distribution after Nassim Taleb, who said that a very large number of events in the world have the characteristic, um, including life itself, of having uh, a very, very, very long sequences of small gains followed by huge losses in one very exciting moment. And that's an earthquake, that's, uh, that's a hurricane, and that may be the global imbalances. <laughs>
So uh, bear that in mind. Um, but I think it's been a wonderful, rich discussion uh, which uh, confirms the fact, in essence, that we are, in, uh, we are I, I fear, in our, at least in our actions, if not in our understanding, in an era of high complacency. Thank you very much.